Neanderthals. Today, in most circles, it's an insult. A byword for ignorance and stupidity. But what were these early humans really like? Well, new revelations over the last couple of years, uncovered at one archaeological site, have been providing us with fascinating new information about our long-extinct close cousins, usually associated with ancient Europe. These findings, however, come not from a site in Europe, but in the Middle East, at an imposing and vast cave in Iraqi Kurdistan, an area bearing the mark of untold epochs of the human story. Dating all the way back to prehistory, perhaps even being near the route Homo sapiens first took out of Africa. This is Shanidar Cave, and the newly discovered burials found here may hold one more piece in the puzzle of how these extinct hominids viewed the world around them and their place within it. Let's take a look. Shanidar. This is an ancient landscape, immobile and fixed for tens of thousands of years. Not far from here, the mighty Assyrian Empire once dominated the known world, followed by empire after empire and kingdom after kingdom down through the long millennia. None of them even amounting to a tiny fraction of the time this imposing monument on the landscape has stood here. It is underneath, however, where things get really interesting. A large cave system was uncovered here and excavated in the early 1950s by archaeologist Ralph Seleski. Little did he know, but this place was about to become one of the most important, though little-known discoveries of the 20th century. Here, in these caves, was found the partial remains of at least 10 men, women and children. Though these weren't people as we would know them, but Neanderthals, our closest hominid cousins, who walked the earth at the same time as us for most of our history. The finds alone are fascinating. Though many similar sites had already been excavated by this point. What made Shanidar really special was what was found alongside the remains. One of the graves here, known as Shanidar IV, was surrounded by clumps of ancient pollen. A coincidence, perhaps. It's impossible to know either way for certain. But Seleski and his team suggested these to be the remains of flowers laid to rest with the deceased. Perhaps an early form of funerary rites. A dear relative being laid to rest. All those generations ago. Very possibly the first archaeological traces of human nature. Excavations continued for another nine years, and Seleski's findings finally immortalized in the 1971 book, The First Flower People. The cave was left again for another half century. Now, nearly 50 years later, Seleski's trench has been reopened by a team of Cambridge archaeologists working closely with the Kurdish authorities. Their findings are remarkable. We've long suspected that anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens, us, have considered our place in the world for as long as we've inhabited it. Stone Age artwork and archaeological evidence tell us that much. 
sophisticated attempts to represent deities, or even just made for a bit of fun. But what about our cousins, the ever maligned Neanderthals? For author William Golding of Lord of the Flies fame, writing in his 1955 masterpiece, The Inheritors, Neanderthals didn't hunt and remained in awe at the human mastery of fire. But was this really the case? In recent years, the argument has shifted the other way, suggesting Neanderthals to be just as sophisticated as modern humans, and maybe not too dissimilar in their nature. Cave art has been found around the world from as early as 40,000 years ago, as well as items made for artistic or spiritual merit rather than day-to-day -day use. And we don't actually know for certain whether these earliest examples were made by anatomically modern humans. Was this abstract thinking limited to us, or did it extend much further back to our common ancestors, even further back in time, such as Homo erectus? We know now from DNA evidence that part of the genetic makeup of modern humans derives from our long-lost cousins. Particularly in Europe, where as much as 2 or 3% of some people's DNA is Neanderthal. Since Selesky's investigations in the 1950s, much has changed in the field of Neanderthal studies. The idea that they treated their dead with reverence has long been debated, varying over time and space. Rarely, however, do we have the opportunity to apply modern techniques to such a grave. But over the last couple of years at Shanidar, excavators have done just that. Just like archaeologists periodically return to the cave systems here, it seems that our Neanderthal forebears did the same, with hunter-gatherer groups returning generation after generation to bury their dead. For a long, long time. The prominent outcropping here potentially serving as a marker for returning clans. The sediment between remains suggests significant gaps between visits, maybe of many hundreds of years maybe less. This is a large cave, so maybe these groups continued returning here without actually realising they were being buried at the same place as previous generations. We simply don't know for certain. Of course, it could be a coincidence, though the sheer amount of separate burials in a relatively small area does seem to suggest importance placed here, and in turn, fresh opportunities to understand Neanderthal capacity for symbolic thought and behavioural variation. The new burial excavated here, found just under Selesky's clusters, known as Shanidar Z, is thought to date to around 60,000 to 70,000 years ago. This is the first articulated Neanderthal uncovered in Southwest Asia in more than 25 years. The sex is undetermined, though teeth analysis suggests an adult individual, well into middle age or older at the time of death. Perhaps an important member of the group afforded special status in death. The skull of the individual as well as the bones of the upper body, had been crushed by the sheer weight of sediment accumulating above over the eons. The rest of the body, however, was mostly intact. Interestingly, the left hand had been raised and positioned under the head, so as to look almost like the figure was sleeping. Behind the head, two stones may have been placed. Had this been done as part of a ceremony, in symbolic reverence for the deceased. We simply don't know yet. Maybe we'll find out more definitively in the future. As always, 
Investigations continue at this fascinating site. You've been watching Archaeology News. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Tell me what you think in the comments, and I'll see you on the next one.